Maria Grazia, Frère Dominus Tecum, Veredicatorum Iebus, Veredictus Ultra Gentis Friedu, Santa Maria, Mater Dei Orfum, Nobis Peccatoribus, Nunc et Terrarium Utis Nostre. Amen. In nome di Patris e Fili e Spiritu Sancti. Amen. Carissimi, beloved in Christ, welcome to this broadcast mass as we said on this, the feast of Saint Peter Nolasco. Not very much is known about his early life. Uh, he was born around perhaps between 1182 and 1189 and died in 1256. Uh, uh, but born, we believe, to uh, noble parents uh, in the Languedoc uh, region of France, uh, later uh, transferring to Barcelona. In 1203, however, we know that uh, St. Peter begins to uh, res ransom captives. Now, it's uh, worth bearing in mind, or putting things in context here. Uh, so we're talking about the uh, coastal region of the Mediterranean, uh, of southern France and southern Spain, uh, down towards Portugal, and then over the Straits of Gibraltar, uh, and, the, and northern Africa. Now you may know uh, that uh, that uh, the lower section, the lower portion of that region was ruled by the Moors, indeed the uh, Caliphate of Al-Andalusia, uh, which many of you possibly know as the Costa del Sol, um, more or less these days. Uh, so uh, the capital of course was uh, Granada uh, and uh, Cordoba, and Sevilla and Malaga and all that area around there was governed by Moors. Now at this uh, point uh, for some 600 years this was the case and uh, the coastal regions there would uh, change periodically uh, uh, from Moorish uh, rule to Christian rule and uh, during those, so it was a, a very unstable time, as it were. Uh, and of course, uh, there were ongoing battles and skirmishes, and often uh, uh, either side uh, would take captives uh, and uh, often uh, sell them as slaves. Uh, indeed, in relative times of peace along that coastal region, uh, it was not uncommon for a, uh, a kind of mutual slave trade to exist between Christian and, uh, uh, and Moors. Now, of course, some of uh, the captives would be uh, noble people and uh, therefore a ransom uh, would be uh, demanded, so a great sum of money uh, to release them. But of course, for the vast majority of captives and for the vast majority of those who would end up as slaves, uh, there was there was no possibility really of release so um, feeling moved uh, by the gospel uh, particularly perhaps uh, uh, from St. John uh, no love hath any man greater than this that he should uh, give his life for his friends uh, St. Peter begins uh, in 1203 to start to ransom captives. He founds a uh, military and religious order. Uh, the, it's something, the full title is something like the Royal uh, Military and uh, uh, Order of Our Lady of Ransom or Our Lady of Mercy. Uh, he founds that in 1218. And the order attracts particularly uh, young noblemen and they come with, as it were, a dowry. They come with often inheritance. And so it would be uh, the inheritance that they often would employ uh, to ransom captives, to ransom Christian slaves. However, uh, Peter Nolasco included a fourth vow for uh, the members of the order. So the members of the order were technically friars. Uh, remember, you may be familiar that at this time various other uh, orders of friars uh, were founded, for example the Dominican uh, order and the Franciscan order. Friars of course being mendicant religious, that is to say 
uh, people who have taken vows, the three evangelical councils as they're called, of poverty, chastity and obedience, uh, but they don't live in community. Or that is to say, they, they may live in small communities, but unlike monks, they do not vow stability in one place. Uh, instead, often the friars were preaching orders. The Dominican order was a preaching order. Uh, the Franciscan order uh, uh, was a, a preaching order. So with the Mercedarians, uh, they took religious vows of poverty, chastity and obedience, but they also took a fourth vow uh, of, of being prepared uh, to uh, ransom, uh, to being prepared to offer themselves in ransom for others, even to the possibility of death. And as I say, they were technically uh, an order of friars, uh, but some of them would be soldiers, some of them would be uh, 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 knights. Uh, so there were uh, knights in the order uh, and friars. Some of the friars uh, obviously were clergy, um, and so you had a mix of, of, of soldiers and uh, uh, but religious, so, so soldiers who had taken religious vows, uh, so they weren't technically uh, allowed to draw blood. Um, uh, some of you who perhaps remember studying 1066 and all that, uh, may remember that William of Normandy's uh, relative, Bishop Ogo, um, uh, who took part in the Battle of Hastings, did so with a club uh, because uh, clergy were forbidden to draw blood. So uh, the religious knights of the Mercedarians uh, were forbidden to draw blood, uh, but they would provide, as it were, protection uh, to the other friars on their journeys of uh, ransom. Uh, and such orders, of course, uh, are otherwise familiar to us as the, uh, uh, the uh, Hospitallers, for example, uh, similarly had Knights, uh, but who had taken religious vows. Uh, similarly, the Templars, the Knights Templars, uh, were Knights who had taken religious vows. Um, so this was a, quite a, a sort of usual, common thing uh, in the medieval period. Where was I? So in 1218, this royal military uh, and religious order of Our Lady of Mercy or Our Lady of Ransom is founded by Peter Nolasco and he is joined uh, by Raymond de Pony uh, Penifor, uh, whose feast is next week. Um, and uh, uh, I can't remember his first name, somebody Nonatus. Uh, those of you who watch Call the Midwife may remember that Nonatus' house is the is the dedication uh, uh, of the uh, of where the nuns are the convent uh, there in Poplar, uh, but Nonatus uh, is a name that comes from uh, one of the saints uh, who was a Mechidarian. Uh, so as I say, so these uh, noble, often young noble men would join uh, the Mechidarians, bring with them their inheritance, and then that inheritance would be used to uh, pay a ransom uh, to free captives or indeed the knights and the friars themselves were prepared to uh, place themselves, offer themselves in the stead of captives, or indeed uh, to die uh, in their stead, uh, having taken this fourth vow uh, to do so. It is said that St. Peter in Alaska himself uh, released, ransomed something like 40,000 uh, Christians and indeed, uh, by the end of the first century uh, of the order's existence, something like 70 to 80,000 souls have been ransomed from captivity. Now, as I say, the, uh, perhaps the inspiration for all of this uh, was the Gospel um, uh, and, and, and the passage from St. John about Greater love hath no man than this. Uh, but also, too, I should mention that St. Peter received uh, uh, visions. He received a vision from Our Lady, uh, indeed him and uh, King James the, the I of Aragon, uh, both received a similar vision of Our Lady, uh, recommending, urging the uh, foundation of this religious order. 
and St. Peter too also received the vision of St. Peter himself. Um, and that inspired him, uh, again with the Gospel passage, uh, to found this religious order. Now the interesting thing, of course, uh, is about that passage, great enough, have no man than this, that he should lay down his life for his friends. Of course it was uh, originally with reference to our Lord, but also too, of course, it has inspired a great many Christians through the centuries. And there are, of course, contemporary uh, examples of uh, saints who have been similarly inspired. We might think perhaps of Saint Maximilian Kolbe in Auschwitz, who, sim who similarly offered himself in the stead of a fellow prisoner who was, uh, who was uh, called out to be uh, exterminated, uh, but who had a family, and Maximilian Kolbe offered himself uh, and, uh, uh, to, to, to die in his stead. And there are other, of course, examples, and probably there will be uh, examples uh, to come yet that we haven't heard of yet uh, from the Middle East, uh, particularly, of course, uh, during uh, uh, the terror of ISIS or Daesh. Uh, we know, for example, already uh, of, of several Coptic martyrs. Um, we know, of course, of the decimation of Christians uh, in Iraq. Um, and more likely than not, there are stories yet uh, to, to come out about those who have given their lives uh, instead of uh, others. For example, um, mothers and fathers who have given their lives instead of their children, uh, uh, religious uh, priests, uh, brothers and sisters who perhaps have given themselves uh, to allow other Christians to go free. Uh, I'm sure all these uh, things are yet to, to come out. And it's a question that is a challenging one for us all. How deep is not just our love for God, but indeed our love for each other? Often when we celebrate the Feast of Martyrs, we reflect on the question, am I, would I be prepared, am I prepared? To die for the sake of my faith? Am I prepared to die for Jesus Christ? Am I prepared to die for God? But also too of course there is this question, would I be prepared to die for the sake of my brother or sister in Christ? Now of course it can be said that to die for our brother or sister in Christ would indeed to be to die for God, it would indeed to be die for love of God and for love of Jesus Christ. But it is, as it were, a, a, a uh, puts another perspective uh, on the notion of being prepared to offer our lives to God. Now, of course, here, my brothers and sisters, uh, it's worthy for us to reflect on the fact that uh, the vocations uh, of the Merchidarians, the vocations generally of religious uh, are but slightly emphasised expressions of the calling that all of us have as baptised Christians to know, to love and to serve God. The religious it sometimes appears to us take it to an extreme but rather perhaps we should say that they take it literally, uh, the call to chastity, to obedience, poverty, etc. But religious vocation, the, the expression of religious life, really is uh, only an emphasis, uh, as it were, a, a greater emphasis on the principles of the gospel that each and every one of us as baptised Christians should be living and conforming and changing our lives too. For indeed, we are all really as Christians called to live in the spirit of poverty. As we heard in the gospel today, we're not supposed to worry about material things. God will provide, God does provide. 
as sure as he provides the water that we drink and the air that we breathe and the life that we have, God will provide uh, the necessities that we need for life. We are all called uh, as Christians to live in a spirit of poverty. We're all called to live in the spirit of obedience, obedience to God's law, obedience to God's commands, obedience to Christ's teachings. No one is exempted from God's law. You may remember, I hope, um, that when you were formed for, uh, prepared for First Holy Communion or Catechism, uh, you, were, uh, you would have been taught the Ten Commandments as well as uh, the great summary of the law and the two great commandments. We as Christians, just because the Ten Commandments are in the Old Testament, we're not exempted from them. Remember that our Lord says, I have not come to set aside the law and the prophets, but to bring them to completion, to perfection, to fulfilment. And of course the Decalogue is summed up by the two great commandments, uh, the summary of the law, as it is called, that Jesus gave us, that we call the two great commandments. They reflect the Ten Commandments, but we should know the Ten Commandments, we should be living the Ten Commandments ourselves. We should be all be living in a spirit of obedience. Likewise, we should all be living in the spirit of chastity. I always find it uh, interesting or intriguing that uh, in the uh, forever going on debates about sex and sexuality uh, that um, Christians forget that anyone who is not married is supposed to live a chaste life. Irrespective of sexuality, irrespective of, of their inclination, anyone who is not married is supposed to be chaste. And yet, of course, we know that now even cohabitation for years is commonplace amongst Christians. But this, this should not be for those who are living according to God's law. Now, the difference only between us and religious is that religious have taken vows before God concerning these three evangelical councils, but we all of us as Christians, irrespective, should be living our lives, conforming our lives, transforming our lives according to these principles. And in like fashion too, though we may not take a fourth vow like the Merchadarians, each and every one of us is called to have such love for neighbour as we might have for God. Indeed, we might say, my brothers and sisters, and perhaps this has just come to me, but perhaps this, uh, I think perhaps this, is a, this is a true reflection. Um, perhaps the paucity often that we have of love for neighbour betrays the paucity of the love that we have for God. Perhaps the limitations that we put upon loving our neighbour exemplify and reflect similar limitations that we put upon our loving God. That we will do so much and no more. That we will give so much and no more. That we will offer so much and no more. And that, of course, is not what divine charity, the true love that we are called to live in with God and with each other, that is a self-emptying love, a selfless love, a continuous outpouring of mercy and kindness, of patience, of compassion,
where all of us as Christians should be living the spirit of that fourth vow of the Merchadarians. Because we should be living we, because we should be living such charity anyway as Christians. We should be living in such love for God that we would gladly die for him. We should be living in such love for neighbour that we would gladly be willing to offer ourselves in their stead or to die in their stead. And there perhaps we should end our thought today and leave you with the question, how deep is my love for God and for neighbour? Do I limit it? Do I constrain it? How far and how much am I prepared to go? And is the way in which I'm prepared to love neighbour reflective of the amount of love that I have for God? Am I truly loving my neighbour as I love God? For surely loving my neighbour is to love God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.